Good afternoon, brethren. I too, as Brother Dan said earlier, I'm glad to be on this side of the live stream today. Um, Sister Barb um, asked me several weeks ago to do a testimony, and she said to share how the Lord has, what the Lord has done in your life, and then she proceeded to say, you have about 15 minutes, and I was kind of amused by that, so, because I'm 54, and he's done a lot in my life, so you'll just have to wait till the judgment day to get the full, the full story. Um, but when I think of giving a testimony, I think of God first, how he's the one who did everything to make this testimony possible. I think of how God gave his son so that none would have to perish. I think of Christ who was nailed on the cross for my sin and how he is reigning today and interceding on my behalf. I think of how I was chosen before the foundation of the world. Chosen, brethren. Ephesians 1, 4 says, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. And oh, how I glory in that. Because not everyone can say that. And I shudder when I think about that. Romans 9, starting with 21, says, Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath, and to make, make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction, and that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy, which he had afore prepared unto glory, even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Oh, brethren, we can rejoice knowing we've been called and chosen. I think of how I was raised from the dead. Yes, I was blind, I was lame, I was dumb. But God, I love those words, but God. And just as Jesus was raised from the dead on an appointed day, he had a day appointed for me to be raised up as well. Amen. And he drew me from a child. I remember my mother teaching me to pray. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. The phrase, if I should die before I wake, really, I, I just, every time I said that, it just made me, it, it just, I don't know, it just made me kind of afraid, I guess. But it got my attention. The expression of it just got my attention. I knew I just, I just knew I wanted to go to heaven. My mother, she was always very diligent in taking me to church. And she's the one that taught me to pray. And uh, she's always been consisting and ins consistent in expressing her love for the Lord, never wavering, and she still does that. I remember, I remember when I was small, I remember hearing what they call the Easter story. I remember every time I heard it, even though I knew what the ending was going to be, on the third day, I was excited to hear it again. Even at a small, young age, I was always just anticipating that part when he was raised from the dead on that third day. And then I remember, um, so, so these, these were things that were leading up to the day when I would be called. And I remember hearing the gospel preached right directly to me. I was 12, and I was in a, it was a little revival in a little bitty town called Summum, Illinois. It was so tiny. It was a big curve in the road, and we would say some of them live on this side, some of them live on that side. But the point was, it was a teeny little town that I went to a revival. My mom took me, but the Lord ministered to me that night in that little church, in that little town, and I was being convicted. I was being called. I was hearing him call me this time. I wasn't hearing with these ears. I was hearing him call me. And uh, I, 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 I talked to my mother about it. And the next night we went to that revival again. And I could not wait for the end when they would have the altar call, they called it. I couldn't wait for him to be finished so I could go down that aisle. And I could give my life to Christ and have my sins washed away. And I made that confession and they actually moved the pulpit right off the stage there, and they lifted up the floor, and the baptistry was right there. And I remember when I come up out of that water, I felt so clean, 
the burden of sin was off my back. And I knew the guilt was gone, and I knew the Lord was pleased with me. I remember, I remember loving to hear the red print, reading the red print, because those were the actual words of Jesus, what, what he actually spoke on this while he was in this world. Red like blood, like the blood that, was, that washed me and made me spotless and white as snow. Oh, I started out strong, and I attended church, but as time passed, I began slipping back. And brethren, I vividly remember when I felt like I was no longer clean. I was hearing how I should be bringing in people. I was hearing how I should go out and be saving the lost souls. I remember feeling inadequate, guilty, and ashamed, and thinking how I needed, I needed to rededicate. I needed to go forward again. After a while, after a while I would stand in my pew I stood in the pew with a sense of hopelessness, thinking how I'd failed. How could I ever get to heaven? I went into the church in need of being built up and instead left feeling worse. And who wants that, I thought. So as time passed, I became a smoking flax of bruised reed. But God. See, Matthew 12, 20 says, a bruised reed shall he not break a smoking flax shall he not quench till he send forth judgment unto victory and i learned later in life that jesus had actually prayed for me this is actually the first verse that actually this um that actually came alive to me the day star rose in my heart when i read this john 17 20 neither pray i for these alone but for them also which shall believe on me through their word and i thought he prayed for me Jim and I moved to Florida with our two children in 96. It was a new beginning for us, and we were at a church, a little church. We were there every time the doors were open. It was Jensen Beach Christian Church. And it was a very hard transition moving away from everybody I knew and loved. But God had a plan for me that required a separation. Some pruning had to be done in order to achieve a greater yield. You see, I'd relied on my family, my mother and my sister, more than going to God first. So God was the one who moved us to move. We did consider moving back to Indiana at this point, at one point, not too long after we were there. Again, but God had a purpose in mind that, he was, that was going to be fulfilled. Well, you see, we hadn't met Brother Jeremy yet at that point in time. And God had that all worked out as well. After being involved with the church organization for a time, I began feeling like I was wanting more. Something was just missing. And I couldn't really figure it out, but I, I just knew I wanted more. So, so I was seeking in other places. I was not only at, at Jensen Beach, and by the way, this was before Brother Ricky was there. I would listen to the radio, to the sermons on the radio, and I actually went to see a popular um, lady that speaks on occasion, and, and I went and I purchased her tapes, and I would listen to them. I would listen to them, and I would listen to the Bible, and, and I would, when I listened to her tapes, I would take what was good and hold on to it and let the rest fall to the ground. But I knew I wanted more. And, um, and through it all, in keeping what I knew, I even had a preacher make fun of me once for listening to her, but that didn't stop me. My appetite was larger than that preacher could fill. And anyway, he moved on. And... Um, Brother Jim, my husband and I, we had found ourselves in a position to call yet another preacher because there'd been one after another. It was a small, it was a small building and a small fellowship. And he was getting ready to call another minister, and I just didn't even want to call him. It's like, what a mess. I just don't want to bring another one down here. I just didn't even want to call him. But God, you see, he'd been voted in. <laughs> And so he made the call, and it was to Brother Ricky Sims. I knew. See, God knew. I was seeking. And he knew what my heart's desire was, and that was to know him. And so Brother Ricky was sent to us. Once Brother Ricky was settled in, and he, he preached a few times, I remember listening and thinking, where in the world is he getting this stuff? 
I never heard this stuff before. It just seemed like everything I'd been taught was like wrong. And I was like, I was kind of discouraged and kind of like, well, you know, like I said, where'd you get this stuff? But I wanted the truth. And what he was saying was the truth. And it was, he was putting it together where it made sense. It fit together. It fit together perfectly. And so I kept coming back. And I kept wanting more. And then at one point, Brother Aaron came down to preach at Jensen Beach. And then after that, Brother Given came down for a revival. You see, the soil had been plowed. And by the time Brother Given was finished, I knew I'd found my first love again in Jesus Christ. And I never wanted to feel hopeless again. So for the last time, I went forward and I rededicated. And I said, I wanted the word to dwell in me richly. So that when I spoke to people, I'd interject the scripture and leave knowing the Holy Spirit would take it from there. I wanted to be used by God and have his will be done in my life. <clears throat> well, several years passed, and Brother Ricky is going to be moving now, moving on. And uh, Nikki and Jeremy actually move on with him. He asked us all to go. And actually, Jim, my husband, lost his job the very week we moved, Nikki and Jeremy, um, to DeSoto, Missouri. And, uh, but God had another, another purpose here, which, uh, well, it's actually the same purpose, is to glorify him. Um, so we dropped off Nikki and Jeremy, and, and we came back, and, and uh, I actually went into my office, because now they're gone, and Brother Mickey's gone, and, and uh, I actually literally just laid my head, and I just really just cried for like four days. I couldn't even pick up my head, and I remember asking the Lord, help me. Help me. How can I be a help to anybody else if I can't even stop crying and pick up my head? And um, so I actually before there was a, just before we moved Nikki and Jeremy, there was a man that came in. And um, you ever heard of a, a wolf dressed in sheep's clothing? Well, that's what happened. And uh, he had some great things to say at first. But as time went on, he started speaking things that I'd just been delivered from. So I didn't want to hear that anymore. And I would actually, I thought, well, maybe that's why I'm here. Maybe that's why I'm still here. I'm supposed to help him now. And I would go to him and share some things. And I even went to him with tears, sincerely trying. You know, I, actually, I showed him. I said, it's right here. And then he just really just turned around and used that and scoffed me publicly and said, well, you know, you might even have people come to you with tears when they are posing you. And um, so anyway, he, he went on and, well, we left, actually left there. But I didn't stop believing God was with me. Because, you see, we're tried with fire. And the longer you're in, the, you know, the longer you put the gold in the fire, the more pure it becomes. First Peter 1 Peter 1.7 says that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perish that would be tried with fire might be found unto praise and honor and glory to the appearing of Christ Jesus. And also it says in James 1, starting with verse 2, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. And let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. And, um, and the Lord brought us the Lord brings us through trials. I remember moving Brother Given, or I'm sorry, I remember moving Brother Levi again uh, later on as well. And I actually, when we were moving him, um, we were just a few miles from the house, and he had put everything in this trailer. And Jim and I were had the trailer attached to our vehicle, and we weren't but 20 minutes from the house, and it started veering back and forth, and it actually jackknifed and came around and knocked us completely off the highway, and it was nighttime. But the wreck happened right in front of a, a service station, so it was lit up. And everything that Levi owned was all over the uh, turnpike and the side of the road. And then in Florida, we have these things called fire ants. And um, what they do is they, they crawl up quietly, and then they all bite you at once. But they bite, and they leave blisters, and they hurt. And so we're, this happened, and, and the first thing that came to my mind when, we, when I got out of the truck was, this confirms to me, i got to get my son out of here. 
I gotta get him out of Florida and somewhere where he can be fed too. He can't be left down here. And we were getting bit by these fire ants all night long. We were picking up his stuff and I said, you know what? Just stomp on him and pretend you're just stomping on Satan's head because we're not stopping. We're getting your stuff picked up and we're gonna move forward. And that's what we did. And we got him here. I can't think of a safer place than to have your children. You, you, can, you, can, you can pack your children and move them away from you. You can do that if you know it's for their good, if you know it's going to save their souls, if it's going to attribute to that. So that's what we did. I even remember at a refreshing water stream all once, it was one of the first ones after being alone in Florida, I said, you might, have, you might find yourself running alone, but keep running. And I can't tell you how many times I thought of moving, moving where I could be with the brethren. Um, but God, and I, I would even think, I would, I would think everybody's advancing. Everybody's moving ahead, and I just feel like I'm being left behind. But no, that's not true. God didn't leave me. He did not forsake me. He's continued molding and shaping me all through this because this is for his purpose, and he is going to be glorified. Isaiah 50 verse 7 says, for the Lord God will help me. Therefore, shall I not be confounded. Therefore, have I set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be ashamed. That's one thing. That's one verse that I think of every time I come together with the brethren because um, when, you, when you've done a work in someone and you see fruit bearing like Brother Ricky has done for us, it's like I, I want him to see. I want him to see that I'm still running. His work wasn't done in vain. I'm still running. Since being separated from, from the kids and the brethren, and they are my kids and my brethren, um, there's always been a constant determination. So I have set my face as a flint, and I shall not be moved. I shall run even if there's no one running with me because I've been bought with a price, and I owe all to Jesus. And even if I never labor along with my family here on this side of heaven, I'm determined to do so on the other side in the presence of God himself and with all his glory, where I will no longer have to fight the good fight of faith. When you serve the Lord, it's for his glory. It's for his purpose. And oh, how thankful I am that he chose me. We weren't promised an easy road while we, were here, while we are here. In this world, we will have, but we can have peace. John 16, says, These things I have spoken unto you, that in ye might have peace. In the world ye have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Amen. In your walk of faith, you may find yourself moving your children, your grandchildren, 1,500 miles away. You might live separate for 11 plus years and counting. You may have preachers and church folk treat you badly and scoff at you for speaking the truth in love. You may even have division in your own home. And you even might feel like you're in a prison, so to speak. Isolation is like a prison. And you may grow weary and you might be cast down at times, but God sees your tears and your struggles. Amen. Second Peter 2.9 says, The Lord knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. Through these past years, these passages have strengthened me. I've often thought of Peter and how he was, um, there were many that were leaving Jesus when he said, this is my body, eat my body and drink my blood. And, there, and many and left him. And he says, will you go also? I, th I, th I thought about that several times. And it's like, I respond like Peter did. Lord, where would I go? You have the words of eternal life. I also think of this. Hebrews 12, 1, it says, Wherefore, seeing we also compassed about by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the rate that's set before us. And I, think, and I think of my life like a classroom and go with this holy imagination. I, um, I think of how maybe one, one in the heavenly realm is saying to another, Hey, come over here. Look in this classroom. 
Did you see that? Do you see that even after being persecuted and for believing that, that she's still running and she's stronger than ever? I don't want to disappoint my father, and I don't want to disappoint these angels that are looking into these things. I want them to, I want them to see what God's doing. This is his glory. This is his glory. I continue to give thanks. I continue to give thanks for God calling me and giving me a new heart. And I must confess, by thy grace, I do what I, 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 I'm still doing what I said I would do several years ago when I went, bef when I went before Brother Given and the, and the rest at the Jensen Beach Fellowship. I, uh, I'm still confessing Christ. I'm still believing. I'm still seeking. I'm still standing strong. I'm not what I used to be. He is still working on me, but I am, I have set my face as a flint, and I'm moving forward. I no longer ever want to stand in a pew and feel hopeless. Amen. I have been led, I have been led to the living water, Amen. the refreshing water. And as I look back on my life, there is one scripture that I quote quite often. And, um, and, it's, and it's Romans 8, 28. And we know that all things work together for good for them, to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Now, um, I, I want to tell you uh, real brief here, just before I, before I close. Um, two year, a little over two years ago, Nikki and Jeremy, a lot of you, went through this tornado in Joplin. And we took Nikki... I was with them, and we drove on Eland, and there was this, uh, we went to look at her house. And two doors down from her house was a little house as well, and it had a homemade sign out front for sale by owner. And I thought, hmm, I, maybe I'll live there one day. And in passing, I actually went back and I wrote down the number. Well, Nikki bought her house on Eland, and time passed. Well, I kept that number, and I actually called that man once, and, and I asked him about it, and um, we discussed it, and he gave me a couple of different... He gave me one price. The next time I talked to him, it was $10,000 more, and I thought, oh, forget it. Well, time passed, and, uh, and it was, and it was uh, repossessed. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to talk to Jim, and, and we put a bid on it a year ago in July, July 2012. We put a bid on it, and they just kind of like laughed us off because it was ridiculously low. A few months went by, and um, it was resubmitted. The same. We thought we'll resubmit the exact same bid as we did in July of 2012. And um, no, no, they didn't want anything to do with it. Um, anyway, short version is on July 26th, I believe, of 2013, I heard from the real estate lady and she said, just out of the blue, I thought it was done. I thought it was over. Uh, well, not completely over because I actually prayed. I said, Lord, the, the bid we've put in is ridiculously low. You'll have to do, if, if it's going to be ours, it's going to be your work. And I left it. And several weeks went by and I got, a, I got a text from the real estate lady and she said, they've accepted your bid. So we are currently in the process of purchasing the house that is two doors down from Nikki. Are we moving yet? That is yet to be determined, but we're one step closer. And when you are when you're in the will of God, He's going to bless you. And so I want to end with this again. And we know because I can say this. I know. I know. You can say you know. You can read you know. But you know, I know. I know how that all things work together for good. To them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For them he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Brethren, we're being sanctified now, and we'll be glorified then. And I'm looking forward to it. Thank you, brother. Amen.